A question humans often ask ourselves is how do you define you? How do you define the self? You can look at personality traits or just go out and say that humans are some of their experiences, but I think a better and broader question is what defines the human experience? In other words, what makes humans human? In this video essay, I'll be taking a look at Anthony Burgess's novel A Clockwork Orange, and not the film. And this is because the film misses a vital last chapter. A Clockwork Orange is set in a pre-dystopian government that begins to test out Skinnerian conditioning. Skinner's theory is basically the idea that human behavior is conditioned, so, in theory, you could condition someone to act well and morally. Burgess implements this theory in the novel with the government attempting to condition the bad out of our anti-hero Alex, who is a seemingly irredeemable 15-year-old thief, rapist, and murderer. The novel is split into three sections of seven chapters. In the first section, we see Alex's violent behavior. In the second, we see the government's attempts to reform Alex. And in the third, we see Alex's life after conditioning. As Alex is reformed, his free will and desire for violence are stripped away from him. He essentially turns into a clockwork orange, which is an organism with the appearance of life, but is really a clockwork toy to be wound up by an external figure. And it is in this novel where Burgess highlights three major aspects that can help us answer the question of what defines the human experience. Morality, free will, and growth. When we talk about morality, what we're really talking about is how humans distinguish between right and wrong. In the first section of the novel, we see that Alex has an incredibly appalling and warped sense of morality. We witness Alex and his friends beat an old man senselessly for reading a book with a dirty word. You naughty old vec you, I said, and then we began to flee about with him. Pete held his rookers and Georgie sort of hooked his rot wide open for him and Dim yanked out his false subies, upper and lower. Urges, pages 6 to 7. With this out of proportionate punishment, we see that Alex finds society's ideas of morality to be silly and worth mocking. When he is caught beating, robbing, and murdering an old lady, he places the blame on his friends, even if they had nothing to do with it. By not accepting responsibility, the reader can infer that Alex has no regard for right and wrong and no regard for the truth or law enforcement. We witness Alex in his most primitive when his sense of morality is unaltered and undeveloped. Looking at Alex's actions in the first section, we see that he consciously chooses to do bad. He describes beating and robbing a husband and wife shop owner duo as this. As soon as we launched on the shop, we went for the slouse who ran it, complete with six dirty rounds. He contemplates raping the wife, vidying her lying there with her grooties on show. I wondered should I or not, but that was for later on in the evening. Burgess, page 10. In choosing to rape someone later, Alex chooses to spare the wife in the present moment. What Burgess highlights here is that when you choose to do bad, you also choose not to do good. Just as when you choose to do good, you also choose not to do bad. In an essay Burgess wrote for The New Yorker, he talks about his Catholic upbringing. He writes that in Catholic theology, there's nothing to prevent you from sinning if you wish to sin. At the same time, there's nothing to prevent you from approaching the channels of divine grace that will secure your salvation. And this is what we see Alex do. In the first section of the novel, Alex chooses to sin. In the 21st chapter of the novel, however, Alex chooses to do good. Basically what this means is that human nature is about having the ability to make your own decisions about morality, to live your life and learn lessons as you please. As the book progresses, we see the connection between morality and free will in defining the human experience. Burgess poses the idea that good cannot exist without evil during Alex's conversation with the prison chaplain. The chaplain tries to dissuade Alex from taking part in the government's Ludovico technique. He ponders over the procedure, saying that the question is whether such a technique can really make a man good. Goodness is something chosen. When a man cannot choose, he ceases to be a man. Burgess, 83. What the chaplain is saying here, and let's keep in mind he is the only religious and therefore morally righteous character in the novel, is that it is better to choose to do harm than to be forced to do good. Now, when you take a step back, one can see that by forcing Alex to act morally, the doctors, scientists, and government are themselves acting immorally. Alex can no longer choose what is right and wrong. He has lost his freedom and his ability to determine his own sense of morality. He still has his own thoughts, though. He plans to hit people, but can't. I could nearly have smacked loud at that if the old razdras within me hadn't started to wake up the feeling of wanting to sick. Burgess, pages 134 to 135. What Alex no longer has is the ability to act on his own thoughts and make choices on his own. His reactions are automatic because he has become a clockwork orange. A psychologist Hartley Burr Alexander wrote, It is our human mind that most widely distinguishes us as men. Mind is called intelligence. 
the word intelligence leans rather heavily upon the active choice-making function of the mind. Because Alex doesn't have any say over his actions, Alex has lost one of the more vitally distinguishing factors of humans, his mind. Free will includes choosing your own sense of morality. In his New Yorker essay, Burgess explains that free will and individuality are so connected that when the state takes away Alex's free will, they also close its victim to a whole world of non-moral goodness. From this, a relationship between free will and emotion, art, and pleasure is created. One of Alex's defining characteristics is his love for music. It separates him from his friends. Now, music is a form of human expression and therefore an extension of human nature. When classical music was played under the films Alex watched during the Ludovico technique, a side effect was created such that Alex feels physically ill upon hearing his favorite music. To lose one's free will is to lose your natural state of humanity, not just being able to establish your own sense of morality, but also how one experiences emotion and pleasure. And it's when Alex has his love for music taken away from him, or I at least, began empathizing. To be human is to experience the full range of human emotion, but Alex has no control over how things make him feel. His emotions are ingenuine. A prime example of this is when the writer's friends use Alex as an anti-government puppet. They trap Alex in an apartment with classical music blaring in the background. And then there I was, me who had loved music so much, crawling off the bed and going oh 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 to myself. And all the time the music got more and more grumpy, like it was all a deliberate torture. Eventually, Alex attempts to kill himself. While a bit extreme, this shows that if you aren't allowed to feel genuine human emotions, then life just might not be worth living. It is with this act of attempted suicide where Burgess highlights that just because human nature is imperfect doesn't mean there is any justification in taking away one's free will. When you take away a person's free will, you take away what makes them human. Eventually, Alex is unconditioned. The doctors were able to reverse the Ludovico technique after his attempted suicide sparked outrage against the government. It's here where the renowned Stanley Kubrick film differs drastically from the original novel. The film ends with Alex sarcastically saying, I was cured all right, in the middle of an orgy fantasy. In the movie, Alex doesn't grow. The novel, however, portrays what I believe to be a more articulate exploration of the human experience, with a 21st chapter that was omitted from the original American publication. In this chapter, Alex goes from what Burgess calls in his New Yorker essay, A Sour Orange, to a being that exhibits decent human sweetness. He's drifting away from his new group of friends and no longer sees the point in a little bit of your old ultraviolence. After an encounter with a former and now married friend, Alex sets some goals. He asks the reader to imagine him coming home from work to a good hot plate of dinner, and there was his petitza all welcoming and greeting like loving. But I had this sudden very strong idea that if I walked into the room next to this room, I should find what I really wanted, for in that other room in a cot was laying gurgling goo 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 my son. And now I felt this bullshy big hollow inside my plot, feeling very surprised too at myself. I knew what was happening, oh my brothers. I was like growing up. Burgess, page 190. Through time and experience, Alex's values and morals have changed. Whether he knows it or not, his experience of having his free will revoked has taught him to be grateful of his ability to make choices. This in turn influences how he values actions. Why waste time beating up old men when you can be creating something bigger than yourself, like a family? In coming across this realization, Alex displays one of the stronger and more resilient aspects of human nature, its capacity for growth. This is a core feature of humanity. We have the ability to learn from our experiences in our own way. Nobody dictates what lessons people learn from situations, and nobody should dictate how an individual will grow. While we don't have to think that Alex is a good person or even empathize with him, and it's perfectly fine if you do, we can look at his narrative to understand the significance of morality, free will, and growth in defining the human experience. As humans, we want the ability to freely experience the full spectrum of human emotion in a genuine way, and, most importantly, develop our own sense of morality.